Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen. And on this week's episode, we welcome the co-founder and CEO of Scalestack AI, Elio Narcheso, to discuss revolutionizing sales ops with artificial intelligence. Elio shares his experience growing up in southern Italy before moving to America to attend MIT and his journey starting his first few startups. Next, we dig into his time working at AWS and how he was able to convince the now CEO of Amazon, Andy Jassy, to allow him to co-found the AWS Global Startup Program to power the go-to-market strategies of later stage startups and what that taught Elio about the best ways to scale. Next, we dig into how Elio came up with the idea for Scalestack and how he is using AI as a tool to enrich the sales operations playbooks for some of the world's fastest growing startups. Lastly, we dig into how founders should know when the right time is to hire the right talent and when to hold back on hiring too fast before they have product market fit. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Elio Narceso from Scalestack. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Elio. Thank you, Matt. You know, we've known each other for over a little over a year now since we led the pre-seed investment in your newest company, Scalestack AI. But for those listeners of ours who haven't heard of you or what you've been up to over the last decade or so as an entrepreneur, it'd be great to get a bit of a background on your personal background, like where you grew up and your journey into entrepreneurship and startups. Yeah, and you invested without meeting me in person, which was like, you know, awesome. <laughs> we only met a couple of months ago here in New York, but my name is Elio, born and raised in Italy. After college in Milan, I um, worked like a little bit, you know, like all over Europe at a management consulting company. And then I did an MBA at MIT and, you know, I decided to stay in the U.S. Entrepreneurship as an idea really came when I was at MIT and I was exposed to like a lot of uh, like entrepreneurs that had been successful or like startups, which was not really the environment that I was familiar with in Italy. Italy is a great place <laughs> for many things, but, you know, starting up a company and scaling it is not one of the easiest things that you can do in Italy. And so I decided to stay. I've been here now since 2006 here in New York. I still have my own Vespa here, uh, so, you know, it's there. <laughs> so I am very Italian still, but I've been here, and I love New York City. I feel like a home. Uh, I became a citizen. Scalestack is my third company that I start from scratch, and I also, like, co-founded, although I was not one of the top guys, and a separate company. Before that, the idea of being an entrepreneur is really to build something that does not exist. That's something that, like, really motivates me a lot. And even when I have had, like, uh, corporate jobs, and the last major one was at AWS, even then, I built something and and launched it, which was a program to support like uh, mid to late stage startups. So I think that like the the reason why entrepreneurship is really like you know the idea to build something that does not exist, build a team around it, and then try to make something that people want. <laughs> it's interesting, like thinking about why your journey, you know, coming from Milan and then getting into MIT and working down the path of entrepreneurship there really set off this sort of explosion in your mind about how you could also be an entrepreneur, even though you came from Milan. And obviously, we don't know exactly what it is probably about the US, but there's a lot of things that culminate in what make you want to be an entrepreneur. Obviously, just walking down New York City, the streets every day, you're always seeing somebody building, selling or doing something. When you go back to Italy, I just want to get a sense, like, do people understand what you do or have been doing? Is the culture starting to change around this? Or is it still set in its ways from even when you were there back in the day? I'm not from Milan. I'm from the south of Italy. I started in Milan. Oh, okay. And the south of Italy, it's even <laughs> you know, more problematic. I would say in the south of Italy, where I'm from, I'm from Puglia, which is an amazing region. Like, you know, it's the heel of the boot. You know, Italy has like a boot shape. It's the heel of the boot. Beautiful, great people. But like the idea of being like an entrepreneur is a very remote concept. Still today, I think in Milan is changing. Milan is very like, you know, advanced city. It's like modern. It's well connected to the rest of Europe. But I think that what really sets apart the US from Europe in general, I don't even want to make it like specific to Italy, but like certainly that's the case in Italy. It's actually the risk of failure. Failing in Italy is culturally terrible. <laughs> you know, there was like, you know, probably up to like 30, 40 years ago, there was a book of people that have failed, like an official 
list of people. I'm not joking. It's like where il fallito, which which is the word for like failure in, in Italian, is like something with that like cultural culturally is unacceptable. In the US, there is this idea that like you most of the time when you start something, it will fail. <laughs> like it's something acceptable. It's something that actually it's part or can be part of the experience and from which you can learn. So I think that culturally, this is something very meaningful that sets apart the U.S. So many stories of people failing and then trying again and making it. And that's a story that like it's more possible here than not in Italy, as an example. Hey, even in Canada, like the acceptance of failure is not something that's well regarded. You're right. Like showing up on the front page of the news for failures is not something that people often want, but we see failure after failure from a lot of people trying things like in the U S now, some of them are fraudulent, but you know, a lot of them are just not the right time. And the legal system there allows you to process your life a lot quicker to get back on the track to try again. Whereas a lot of cultures and societies don't make it very easy for you to fail and then get back on your feet again. So that's a very interesting point here. Now, you shifted from obviously corporate world to the entrepreneurship world, but can you talk about you know your experience building Mobabe's uh, uh, company and how you obviously got that company acquired by Install and what kind of lessons you learned? Technically, that was my first company that I started from scratch on my own. Before that, together with others, we started another company that sold ringtones. You know, you remember when ringtones? Were <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so we did well with that company as well. And it was, for some reason, like a, a space where Italians were very good at it. There were like four or five Italian companies that like expanded internationally and like, uh, and they developed early on a lot of competencies around mobile payments mobile advertising, content and media for the small screen. And so then after that experience, which concluded also with an acquisition but from a private equity, I started Mobile, which was like a mobile ad network. And so the idea was to connect like uh, mobile app developers with like uh, audiences by meaning like, you know, like um, or connecting them with those audiences, you know, through websites, mobile apps, and other stuff. I love advertising. It's a great space. You learn a lot because you get exposed to a lot of different companies. And so I think that one learning from that experience was that, like, really to be listening to customers that come with very different needs and very different perspective because their business is so different from the next customer. And so I think that that's one interesting learning that I took there Uh, because in the first experience, I've only focused on like selling to telecom carriers mostly. That's basically the world that you know or that I knew. But then when I switched to mobile advertising, it was really, hey, let me understand what this customer actually does and what are the goals that they want to achieve. And so that was something very interesting that happened at that company. I did learn at that company that I should not have started the company on my own. (laughs) And I I promised to myself that I would never do that again. And I think that like while the company eventually got sold and it was, you know, uh, successful, it was very hard. There is a reason why like, you know, you always see like two, three founders. It's so difficult to build something from scratch to make it grow. And you need someone at your level, what I mean by that at the level, at the same level of risk, at the same level of like things at stake, uh, that you can compare notes and even like, you know, complain and, you know, discuss things. So that's the second learning from that company. And then the, the third is like, um, the learning of making a deal, uh, to sell your company it was very interesting. Um, the process was very long. <laughs> And it involved having my people interviewed by that company. And so making sure that like uh, you prepare your people well, and even before that, that you hire well. If you're successful and like you can sell the company at every stage, hiring is so important. And so that even when a transaction comes, in my case, it wasn't a huge transaction. It was like decently sized, but um It was very important for them to meet like the top people, to interview them again. And in some cases I had to prep them. The reminder and the learning is like, you know, hire well, which is one of the topics that like, you know, you and I have discussed in the past. Hiring well is so important. It's the primary goal of like um, a founder 
to surround themselves with good people and that are like aligned with the vision, aligned with the culture, and they can take the company forward together with you. Yeah, you and I have gone back and forth on hiring fast, hiring slow, you know, hiring for the right pace at which your company is growing. Uh, and I want to get into that. But, you know, it's interesting you say that you had to prepare your team for the conversations and kind of like interviews they would go through for the m and buyer. And we've seen that a lot with our companies and people don't think about that. Obviously, they're just looking to hire for the task at hand. But a lot of deals hang on that sort of interview process. And it's almost like the final checkbox. And sometimes it doesn't work very well for those companies and they end up losing the deal or renegotiating the deal. So that's a really good point. But, you know, after selling the company, you spent four years at AWS in New York, you know, you are the uh, principal BD for startups, the program manager for the AWS global startup program, where you manage the AWS startup program to power a lot of go-to-market strategies, work with a lot of great companies uh, you know, in that program. What lessons and what experiences did you take away from your time at AWS that you've now applied as you build out ScaleStack? Well, AWS was an, a great experience. It was almost like a career check for me. Like after a few years, like as an entrepreneur, I did want to experience myself in a situation like at a larger company and, uh, and see if I would do well. But I also was very curious of specifically about Amazon. I had studied like the leadership principles in books and read about them. And I was very curious. And so I wanted to see that in action. It was a great experience. It was almost like going back to do an MBA for me, <laughs> like an executive MBA. I, I was hired as a senior person in the BD team with like a loosely defined mission to do more with mid to late stage startups. So there was really not much of a guideline. It was just like, hey, we have a lot of programs to support early stage companies, you know, like AWS credits and stuff like that, but we don't do enough for mid to late stage. And that's where like Google and Microsoft can do a lot. At the beginning, it was like a small team and we started working with like a small sample of mid to late stage uh, startups. And then I started testing some ideas. One thing that like I learned, uh, I had studied about Amazon and that I saw in action was, hey, if you have an idea, write about it, write a doc. This is like in AWS or Amazon uh, language is like, if you have an idea, write a doc. And then like, you know, if the doc survives <laughs> several, several stages of iteration and readouts, then like it may become something real, a product, a new campaign, a program, an initiative. And so I wrote like a first version of the doc and then it went well and, you know, like it became like bigger and bigger. I, I wrote like there are two different formats that you, you can use at Amazon. I use the PR FAQ format, which is like you write a press release with a frequently asked question uh, section about what you want to launch as if it was real, but it's not yet. You're just planning for it. I love that. It's better than any pitch deck structure probably out there. Yes. And so after like nine months of like uh, readouts, it was eventually approved by Andy Jassy, which was the CEO of AWS at the time now, like the CEO of Amazon. And we launched this program, which still exists. It's my legacy at AWS. It's called the AWS Global Startup Program. It's a program to support the go-to market of mid to late stage companies. So to do co-selling, co-marketing, joint development with them. By the time I left, there were like 600 startups under management, billions of revenues on, on the line, like, you know, lots of initiatives to let them work with enterprise customers. And that's where I had the idea uh, for ScaleStack, looking at all of these amazing startups and yet like seeing how they were like struggling with some specific aspects of their go-to-market made me think of the idea behind ScaleStack. That's incredible. I mean, tell us about some of the companies that you got a first look at and the struggles they were facing. Because we all hear about, you know, the web flows and the notions and some of these big breakout companies that obviously started on AWS, but we never got to really understand how they struggled with their go-to-market strategies early on and how you came up with the idea for scale stack based on those conversations. Are there any examples you can share? Well, I mean, I think that, for instance, Zapier was definitely an inspiration. It was one of the companies that like, I worked closely with uh, in my time at AWS. And it was not only an inspiration for like ScaleStack itself, because what Zapier does is to connect apps between them with like easy uh, and automated workflows. But they were like 
in, a, in an interesting inflection point. They had grown like crazy without having a sales team. You know, they basically sold through like uh, the the portal, and like people would just connect their apps and pay like you know for the zaps um, that they would use. But as they grew, they needed to build like an enterprise sales strategy. And in, even though they were like well funded, like doing well, clearly like beyond product market fit, like growing like crazy, they struggled a lot to define like, you know, what are the targets that we should give to our new sales team that we're building? How do we focus their attention? How do we build like a repeatable sales process by which like they get leads, they get like the right priorities and they focus on those to maximize conversion. Even though these were mid to late stage startups, these were not like the early stage just starting like founders and that's it. These were like, you know, 100, 200, 400 people already type of companies. And yet they were all struggling with the same problem to get more leads, to get like better guidance and direction to their reps in the very first step of the sales process, which is the targeting stage, right? There is a lot of sales technology to engage with customers. Think about the CRM, think about like, you know, the recording uh, of calls or like uh, the DocuSend or the DocuSign of this world. They're all like, great, once you have an actual prospect, once you know who you're talking to and you're trying to convert them into customers. But the very first step, which is who should we target and why and when, it's left basically to the imagination of reps and they become very inefficient trying to figure that out on their own or like by trying to connect the dots uh, with custom code between like uh, the data that they have in their CRM, the data that they buy, the data that comes from market. It was interesting, you know, like when you look at companies like that have raised the amount of money that Notion has or uh, Webflow, you assume that they got everything figured out. <laughs> and actually, it's not like that, but not because they're not good. They are actually great companies. It's very hard. And simply technology has not provided that answer yet the sales process is still very inefficient, crazy inefficient. Today, I mean, Salesforce did a study last year and, you know, across 8,000 reps that they interviewed, they came up with like uh, a number, 72% of their time, the reps time is spent on non-selling activity. 72% are on non-selling activities. That's updating Salesforce. That's updating. Yeah, manual research about prospects and companies to target and all of that stuff. I'll send you the link. To That's study. incredible. And you see it firsthand. You know, I read like prospecting docs for that program that I built at, uh, at AWS, like prospecting docs by these great companies, you know, that are trying to enable their reps and telling them, all right, go on Crunchbase to research companies and then go on, you know, like LinkedIn Sales Navigator to find out about people and then go to Zoom Info or like uh, Lucia or Apollo to find contacts and start the outreach process. This is a crazy manual process that like reps have to do mo in most cases. And so 72% of their time is wasted, quote unquote, in non-selling activities. And that was the observation. Okay. I mean, that problem is obviously quite large and quite difficult because it's still been around for like 20 years. So Talk to us about like the actual creation of the initial scale stack AI product and what you were trying to really do in helping prioritize actions for sales reps using AI. At the beginning, it was just like, hey, people spend so much time connecting the dots between all of these different data sets. There is a lot of data. So, and data is very valuable, but like, it, since there is so much, it's almost like a commodity, right? And so, actually, the connecting the dots just like Zapier had showed us, like the connecting the apps is where there is a lot of work that people do, manual work. And so connecting the dots between like three big groups of data, the data that you have, let's call it first party data in your CRM, the data that like uh, your users may be like filling in forms, so zero party data, and then the, the data that you buy, third party data. And so connecting the dots, so that they all talk to each other and that the data you have in your CRM is well enriched and prioritized with everything that you know from Crunchbase, from news, from Zoom Info, et cetera, is where we zoomed in like our attention at the beginning. So automated workflows. There was no AI at the beginning. We kept discovering that there was the potential to do 
more with AI later on when we saw that like the data needed not only to be well enriched and connected to each other, but also prioritize. Hey, where do I go first? And so that was an awesome use case to use machine learning models to run like all of the accounts and target lists through machine learning models so that like the list of targets that a rep has is not just like in alphabetical order. I've seen reps using alphabetical order to prioritize their efforts. But in terms of like, what are the targets that based on all of the data across like, you know, 10 different data sources based on like five or 10 different like uh, ICP attributes, ideal customer profile attributes, based on that, it's prioritized. And then as we did more and more with customers and with, you know, Mongo and Typeform, we, we realized that like we had like an awesome opportunity to use AI to do the last mile even if you give them like all of the data, it's still like very hard for a rep. Like you say, like you you have like 200 target accounts. How do you figure out like all of the data, even if you have easy access to that data? And how do you decide what are the things and companies and people you should target today? And so that's another awesome use case for AI that can easily parse through millions of data points and synthesize the data that you need at the right time. And so we kept adding more and more use cases for the AI based on what we needed to accomplish because AI is a tool. I mean, like at the end of the day, it's not the goal. The goal is really to make reps very effective and efficient and productive and to hit the right targets at the right time. So that's the goal. But using AI, we are discovering that it can add like speed, it can make them more efficient and it can simplify or automate tasks that were used to be manual. Okay, I want to double click on that because we have so many companies that start with AI as the platform and don't recognize that there actually needs to be a real problem use case that can be solved without AI and that AI can be added on as a tool if they really want to see pickup and success. And the way you did it was you actually incorporated your system without AI into the workflow within Salesforce for your customers to feel like it was kind of like on the side of what they're currently doing on a day-to-day basis. And then to provide more efficiency and speed, you use AI as a tool. And we've had other companies that do it the same way uh, without AI first as a wedge, and then they enhance it with AI. So what advice would you have for founders who are pitching it as a AI first productivity tool, but really it shouldn't be, it should be the opposite. And how has your ability as founder-led sales, uh, because you are doing all the sales at Scalestack, helped you not over-promise that AI enhancement uh, while learning about the problem space for a lot of the customers early on? I could talk a lot about this. In my like career with Skipover, I did have two exits, but I also failed once. And talking about failure, I want to highlight that. It was a company that did like had an awesome technology. It was a sensor that you could plug into any physical store and like it would read and understand how many people there were and how many like uh, movements and it would send recommendations to the store owner and manager. That company was called Measure It. And it was an awesome technology that we developed. I got too in love with the technology and forgot that really I needed to sell that technology to someone that wanted it. At the beginning, we were moderately successful and there was some traction, but then it became clear that it's very hard for retailers, which was our primary target, to buy what we were selling and that it was more like a nice to have type of use case for them and not a must have, like, otherwise, like, we die type of thing. Back then, I promised myself that I would not make that mistake again. It should be like why you fail, right? So if you fail, like at least learn something. And definitely like when when I've done that, like it's been good. Alex and I, my co-founder at Skillstack, we've always been like very focused on like we want to make stuff that people want. That's when it gets exciting. You know, it gets exciting if there are customers that are using your product and are using that more. And you, I mean, we have only a few customers, but they are expanding our contracts with us and more customers want our product. And so that's what I really get inspiration from and not just the technology. 
It's so hard to, the, but a founder always falls in love with a solution because they're an optimist building a technology. But why is it so hard for them to fall over the problem and then the solution that's enabled by technology? Because, I mean, it's harder to get to that point. But if you are a founder and let's say you've been exposed to the thrill of building something, a technology or solution that like does not exist and then it comes to life. But then you also have been exposed to, you know, a company that has a lot of users that love your product. It, it doesn't compare the thrill. So even just in like terms of personal motivation, once you see users using your product and they love it and they tell you so, and they tell others about your product, there is no comparison. I think it's just more difficult to get to that stage and being exposed to that like type of thrill. It's probably like uh, one of the reasons. It's very easy to fall in love with the solution. We try not to think about that in terms of, oh, like, oh, it's so elegant, right? No, it, it's just like, is it useful? Be, are people using it and find that, like as a necessary tool in their stack? Right. Now, I want to think about other things that we've talked about offline, which is the part about how you've been adamant to drive founder-led sales very aggressively at scale stack for the first, let's say, you know, 10 customers. Why is that so important to you? And what advice would you have for other founders who may not have as much sales chops or experience as you do when trying to get those first 10 customers onboarded and, and utilizing the platform? Why is that so important for an early stage startup? Oh, because I think that there are so many things that you still have to figure out. An awesome advantage that the founder has is that there is so much knowledge that she or he has. The knowledge comes from having thought about this problem for so long and having experience, like, you know, the different angles by which this problem can be solved, that like it becomes natural to talk about it, to talk to customers and so. If you don't do that, and if you just like do the work around product and you don't talk to customers and try to sell this, and by selling, you learn so much if you do it right, then like you don't get exposed to a lot of the learning that you need to do. So I don't know if the number is 10 or five, depends also what's the size of the deals. To me, like the key is one, my own self-confidence. I need to feel like very confident in hiring a salesperson. I think it's an incredible responsibility hiring like a salesperson. It's relatively easy to hire a product person or an engineer because I mean, to start the company, you need to write code. You need to hire like, you know, the core team. Hiring a salesperson means that you're very confident by your product and that it works and that you have identified like a repeatable motion, you know, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel in every sales process that you do until you're very self-confident and you tell yourself, okay, I feel like, you know, now there is enough meat, <laughs> let's say, for like a salesperson to join the team. And like, unless you, you feel that like uh, there is a repeatable process that you can actually codify and explain to others, okay, this is how we sell then you should do the sales. Yeah, I'd, I'll say it here right now. The scariest thing is seeing a pre-seed company hire a salesperson before they've reached maybe half a million in ARR. Uh, I know like is not a hard number, but it, it is very scary when a founder is hiring somebody who's just focusing on sales when they haven't even actually had conversations themselves as the founder with a lot of those customers and seeing all the pain points that you have to go through to build the product, the customer support, the onboarding, you know, to hand that off and delegate sales that early is just a big red flag for us at Ripple. So take what you will from that. But I've seen it just not work out many, many times. And you think about what salespeople are motivated by, right? They're motivated by bonus structure for closed deals. And so they may end up just getting you a bunch of non-ICP customers because they want to get that bonus. And then you end up having bad customers who are building, you know, telling you what things to put in the product from a feature standpoint. And it doesn't just jive with what you actually think the problem is that you're solving. And that solution is way off the base. So I'm very adamant about that. I think, uh, I think it's very important and it is a big responsibility and like founders should feel that way, I think. Also because it's a, it's a very important difference between like the founder that sells that can sort of like stretch <laughs> the limits of what the product can do and still be credible and still feel that they are presenting and selling a vision 
versus a salesperson that needs to actually sell a very specific product. They cannot like present a vision, right? It's not their job. It's the job of the entrepreneur to present the vision and sell the vision until like you can actually sell a specific product that you're confident can work once deployed the customers and so on. You should probably think twice about hiring this person. And then also building that trust with those initial customers, which, you know, obviously you've done very well. You've got some pretty big name customers on your website, MongoDB, Typeform, Lasso, Remote, Harness. There's a lot of the big, big tech companies that are being listed on your website as customers. So maybe you can share how the customers are looking at ScaleStack to help redefine their go-to-market strategy and maybe how they look at you versus the other productivity tools out there in the sales and rev ops space and how you differentiate? We're very excited by our customers and we learn so much and, and, and we're developing like deep relationships with them. On one end, like ScaleStack is more difficult to sell because it's not an easy point solution and, you know, that people just buy. We just close remote as a customer. It took us like a good three, four months. And it's not like three, four months that you spend pitching, but it's like three, four months that we invested into really understanding what they needed to do, what are the workflows that they need to do um, to accelerate their go-to-market, and what's the importance of figuring out like the key targets in terms of companies and leads and all of that. So that's how we spent a lot of time. Then we spent a lot of time in terms of like understanding how we would integrate into their systems, the CRM and, you know, the data lake and all of that. You learn a lot about the customers. So you, you want to be and you have to be very curious. And so I go back to my advertising days, you know, like I, I became like super curious about other people's business. So for me, it's super exciting to understand how another company works. How do they make money? Who are their customers and how the, the entire machine works? And so I think that that process, if done well, can build a lot of trust with customers. So not only I'm proud of the customers that we have, but also the relationship that we've been able to develop. They all like are expanding, renewing contracts with us. They make recommendations to into their network and like tell others about like they're using Skillstack. We've had James Underhill and MongoDB just you know, do our first podcast episode, by the way. And I'm going to present at the Revenue Up Summit uh, conference with him uh, at the end of March here in New York. Those are things that show that like uh, there is a partnership almost because we are working on really interesting problems, but we're building that trust that is necessary between a customer and a vendor. I hate the term vendor, but like, you know, if you move it to a partnership, that's when the magic happens. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree anymore. I think their first like 10, 20 customers, even at the you know stage you're at, founder-led sales, those are partnerships. They are not vendor sales. You know, you are talking about building three to six month relationships with everyone in the organization from your you know internal sponsor to some of the early adopters who you've obviously moved very quickly from a first call to like a text message conversation uh, and starting to really understand their needs is very different than some of the other sales productivity tools out there and the way they're selling. Especially your work with MongoDB. Talk about the ICP that you're targeting and how you've been very systematic at saying no to companies, even though your solution may help them, doesn't really fit into the the partnerships that you're looking to develop uh, at the stage that you're helping companies. So one comment on the text message, I think it's a very important step that you want to make sure that you hit. If you feel comfortable to text someone and that someone answers, then like I think that there is something going on. So I'll tell you a little side note there. My very my favorite interview question when I was hiring salespeople was show me the last text message you've had with one of your customers that you're trying to close. And if they didn't pull up their phone and show me that they had one, I would be like, Why aren't you texting any of your customers? And they say, Oh, it's just all over email. That's a terrible sign. I think it's getting more interesting now. Like it's, text messages have been going around for like decades now, but like it's getting like more like that. I think also because exactly there is so much email, there is so much noise that if you as a seller feel confident to text someone and that someone answers and engages with you, then the relationship is already at the next level. And you are also able to like parse through like the noise and like get visibility otherwise like you know you get lost in the 
thousands of emails. Yeah, I have, I have a different theory, actually. I think it's because in your email, it's kind of like your, your professional uh, you know, workspace, email is professional. When you go over to you know, messaging, you're getting messages from like your kids and your partners and your family. And then a work thing comes in. You're like, oh, this is like a friendly conversation place as well. So the mindset people have in those conversations are much more natural. They're less structured like they are within an email. And so you get that authentic response sometimes, I find, which is really important about building trust. Yeah, I like that. I don't think it's because like it's uh, between the messages of your friends and stuff, but because the tone is truer, right? It, you're more That's true. right. Conversational. And, and conversational. And then you're simply, there is no like buzzwords and like you know, structured <laughs> way. And you're just more personable. So yeah, I think that uh, that's also uh, true. But I think it's a very important step for a seller, uh, especially if they need to develop like uh, enterprise type of uh, processes. And I forgot your question. Yeah, Sorry. the question. No, the question was really about comparing to all the other productivity uh, tools out there and how you're envisioning like automation transforming the enterprise sales, you know, go to market uh, world because there's a lot of tools that have come out lately. A lot of enhancements with AI applied to existing enterprise tools. You know, how do you think about this in terms of the future? Uh, of what scale stack can be, and also some of the competitors out there. You know, people are always saying, "Oh, well, can't Zoom Info do this or Gong or you know things like that?" How are you thinking about the world? Well, first of all, I'm very excited in general. Uh, I was reading an article uh, in the New York Times yesterday, and it talked about how we may be on the verge of a new massive productivity increase, just like what we experienced in the U.S. in the mid '90s where like, you know, the economy kept growing and there were fears that inflation would grow as well, as is normally the case, but it didn't happen because productivity also massively grew. And then like, you know, in the last few years, the productivity gains have been like, you know, moderate, but like now with AI, there is like an incredible opportunity to, at least in the office environment, massively regain productivity. And so there is this big trend that is very exciting. The other is in sales today, despite all of the tools, all of the data sources, and you named like a couple, as we mentioned earlier, there is still a lot of manual processes. There is still like a lot of stuff that should be automated because like, I think that we're like humans are more valuable in those things are in those things that it's very hard to automate. And if you repeatedly have to like, you know, scout for information about a target, a company on like four different sources and connect the dots and like go back to the CRM and, you know, try to make sense of the data that you just read, all of that, it's a manual process that should be automated. And that's our vision. We are kind of different than many potential alternatives out there because since the very beginning, we realized that we were not building a point solution, but we were building more of a, it's called like compound type of startup where we have to do many things in order to get to where we want to get and solve customer problems. You know, we need to build workflows that connect the dots between data sources. We need to use machine learning to prioritize the data. We then need to connect to systems easily, like the CRM, data lakes, and so on. And then we need to do the last mile delivery into a sales loft or outreach in order to deliver the insights so that can reps can, you know, send those emails very efficiently. I think that that's uh, where we are focusing our attention. We want to make sure that at every stage, we make the life of reps easier with less manual work. And also we help rev ops and sales ops teams to productize what currently it's mostly solution or customer custom software that they have to build in order to make it all work. And th this all stems on the thesis that humans are not being replaced by AI agents in the enterprise sales world, right? Yeah, I have a much more optimistic view. I mean, I, I, I <laughs> in Italy, for instance, like going back to the Italians, like they already, and it, this is crazy. So in Italy, the debate is about regulating artificial intelligence right now, which is crazy. Oh, we need to regulate and like we should not allow like, you know, you know, things to be done on artificial intelligence, but like we still are like so early. And so we still, there's so much that we don't know. It's going to augment what we do. 
Think about a rep that today spends 70% of their time like on manual task. Think about what they can do with that 70% if a bot or like an AI is doing like the majority of that work. They can spend more time with customers. They can do like uh, more interesting like uh, account strategies and they can like talk to more customers. I think that it's going to be just like uh, Steve Jobs said that like the computer is like the bicycle for the mind. You know, I think it's going to be something similar. And also, let's not forget that, like, you know, we're talking about like a specific section of the economy, which is the office work that clearly has stagnated in terms of productivity in the last like decade or so. And so I think this is a welcome boost (laughs) to what we need to do. Right. I mean, no one's going to be going out and buying a $250,000 Ferrari without talking to salespeople or like, you know, looking to buy it through a chatbot. And nobody's going to spend quarter million dollars buying a software solution for their entire organization to use through an agent, like a chatbot agent. Like there is humans involved in these because of the cost, you know, the risk, customization sometimes. And just, yeah, I think you're right. It's like the treadmill for you know the new age sales software. Switching gears, you mentioned you launched a uh, podcast recently, which I listened to is amazing, called Revenue Engine Masters. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What kind of guests you're looking for and maybe the vision for the podcast? Yeah, our current ICP, I think you asked me earlier, but I'm very bad at remembering the question. Our current ICP is like uh, people in RevOps and sales ops revenue engine people that work at companies that are like, you know, I would say between a thousand and 10,000 employees, they are growing. So the MongoDB, the type form, the remote, these are the type of companies that are our customers. RevOps as a category, uh, job category is one of the fastest growing job categories in America. And I think it's super exciting because like uh, we realize that the sales process uh, is very inefficient. And so we need to build systems and products in order to make it more efficient. And so that's why RevOps as a job category is growing so fast. And so I find that they are like very interesting people. They are not like the typical salesperson that you imagine. They are like more similar to product people. And so there is a lot that they have to share about how they're thinking about like creating more efficiency and like, you know, uh, increasing the number of revenues based on like products that you can build on the system that you currently have. And and so we're going to invite people like that. Our first guest, I, I was as mentioned, was James. Patricia from uh, Typeform just agreed to be our uh, one of the, our next guests. Uh, so it's people that are really part of that conversation, people that are working to generate leads, people that are working to make like a life of reps easier, or people that are building like enablement tools so that sales process, the sales process can be smoother. Now, amazing. Well, can't wait to hear the uh, next few ones roll out. You know, speaking of podcasts, let's jump into our fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast besides Revenue Engine Masters. Well, I just watched like uh, the um, the podcast that uh, Lex did with uh, Jeff Bezos. And I thought that like that was very interesting. I've watched now like a number of them and like the insights that it generates in a very personable and like intimate tone. You watched three and a half hours of a podcast? Yes. (laughs) It it was was two hours, was two hours, but like, uh, (laughs) I don't know, the tone was so relaxed and like so intimate that. Did you ever get a chance to meet Jeff Bezos when you worked at AWS or just Andy Jassy? It was fun. I... (laughs) One of our customers of my startups was ArcXP, which is like uh, the tech division of the Washington Post. As you know, the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. And so I never met him in the context of Amazon, but I basically, (laughs) he had just left a room where we had a meeting at the Washington Post and I was entering. And so that was my interaction with him. So very brief, (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Fair enough. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog? Matt Levine, uh, Bloomberg. I learned so much about, you know, the world of finance is super interesting for me. I don't know much. I want to know more. And so like, it's a great uh, newsletter that I read very regularly. And like, yes, the quirky humor is great as well. Ask me anything you want. I spent uh, 10 years living in New York on Wall Street. So happy to chat finance anytime. Next is your favorite tech gadget. 
I don't use many. I mean, like uh, I, the phone. You got it's, it. Could be your Vespa. <laughs> no, not very technical. No, like you know, actually, today wouldn't start because of the cold weather. No, I would say that, like you know, my phone for sure. You know, I don't have an iPad. I don't even have like an iWatch. I was thinking, like you know, I really love Sonos. Uh, the sound system that I have at home. Yeah, we have them all over our house. And and that's great. And I was exposed to that like very early because it's a company that was like started when I was at MIT. And like, I really love their products. There is really like a care, like in how there is no like uh, crazy dashboard. It's like three buttons and so simple. And I love that. Very cool. Next is your favorite. And that was a very European answer, by the way. <laughs> um, your favorite uh, new trend. I don't know what we talked earlier about the productivity. I mean, like uh, this article, I'll send you the article from the New York Times yesterday was really interesting. I mean, look at the stock market. I mean, like we've been fearing like the inflation growth for most of like the last year and a half, two years, and yet the economy keeps growing. And so I think one of the ways you can justify that is productivity gains. Obviously, like, you know, AI has introduced uh, some productivity already, but like not as, you know, as much as it can generate. So I think that that's definitely something that I'm monitoring uh, and trying to read as much as I can. Gotcha. Next is your favorite book. I read this book. Um, it's called um, Guns, Germs and Steel. Like I'd read it m many years ago and then I tried to read it like, or at least like uh, parts of it, like, uh, you know, often. Uh, that's by Jared Diamond. Yes. And it's so... Why did you reread it recently? No, because, I mean, like, uh, you think about wars. Everything going on in the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So think about wars. Why, I mean, like, all these wars and, like, you know... And I think that, like, the attrition between, like, nations or people is often, like, justified by, like, you know, some of the technology gains and, and why, like, certain people seem to be ahead of other people... It's also a very interesting uh, question. I also watched like Oppenheimer, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And it was in super yeah, interesting. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, it was super interesting to me, like, you know, to think about like Germany was like ahead. And yet like the way they did it, almost like a mini Silicon Valley in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, was the right way to share information. And so that like uh, you could advance towards the goal. I think it was because it had been already cycle of innovations in the US at the time. Like, you know, think about the railroads or the, like, you know, other oil, cars, you know. Production line. Yeah. yeah. So they were like already examples of like, okay, let's get together and let's see if we can advance. I think that idea of like collectivism really is what kind of got them to the point where they succeeded over the Germans for sure. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. I used to work like nonstop through the weekends. And then when my first son uh, was born, I decided I couldn't do that. And so I became ruthlessly efficient in anything that I do. That was one learning. But then I see that I keep learning like how to to be a better father, like a better listener, you know, to be curious about what they do as they grow up and like, you know, they have their own opinions. So I, I feel that I'm learning a lot from them. And if I apply the same curiosity and the same like care to like relationships and people and friendship and, you know, even coworkers or like uh, partners or like uh, customers even, it works out pretty well. And so I, I feel like I'm, I'm learning a lot from them. Hearing that from you with three kids and I've got two young ones, it's really refreshing. I definitely had that moment this weekend where I wanted to do some work and catch up, but I knew that, you know, it's the weekend, it's time with family. And then again, yeah, listening, quiet time, patience, reading the sort of emotions uh, of a two and a half year old crazy toddler is uh, is extremely valuable and applicable to what we do in our day to day workshop. So I appreciate you sharing that with us, and thanks for joining us in the tag today with Elio Narcheso. Thank you, Matt. Great to be here. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tank Talks. We hope you found today's conversation as insightful as we did. If you're enjoying the show, we've got three quick things to ask of you. First. Hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or YouTube. Next, follow us and stay up to date on upcoming episodes and behind-the-scenes content on social media with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And lastly, share the love. If you found value in today's episode, share with a friend or colleague who'd benefit too. 
Your support helps us bring in more amazing guests and keeps the Tank Talks engine running. That's it for today. Until next time, keep disrupting and innovating.